John Stoll. I'm a jazz guitarist. I did not start out playing jazz, but I've been playing jazz now for about 50 years, finding my own style in my 20s, and I've been developing it ever since. Many collaborations with multiple musicians over that time, probably 50 or 60 CDs, all in the jazz style. Um, collaboration with multiple instruments. I play solo, very often in duo, trios, quartets, usually not bigger than a quintet, so usually small group jazz. I've done this professionally in 20 countries uh, all over the world, beginning touring probably in the late 1970s with David Friesen, a bassist, and now with collaborations with many, many different musicians all over the world. And I would still think of myself as developing as a teacher and a player and a student, really, of the music. Improvisation to me is not the most, it probably is the most important part of what I do. And improvisation, I think, begins by learning improvisations from other musicians that you love. So we begin maybe by copying and borrowing ideas from other musicians to learn how to think in a creative way. So we learn patterns and ideas from other musicians, but the idea then is to break apart those patterns to find a melody. My goal is to always think of a melody when I'm improvising. So all the study is about trying to take a pattern and take it apart, deconstruct the pattern, and find a melody. The melody can come from the song. Maybe you use a variation on the written melody of the song sort of to honor the composer and have your solo, your improvisation, reflect some of the harmonic and rhythmic values of the song. But to me, a melody, you can recognize that it's a beautiful melody. Everyone has a different definition of a beautiful melody. Maybe my idea of a beautiful melody is not someone else's. That doesn't bother me. I try, I try not to worry about pleasing anybody else if I'm improvising. I'm playing and I'm thinking, is this a melody? Does this feel like a melody to me? And if I'm succeeding, it feels like a melody. Sometimes also slowing down, not playing very fast, allows you to find a melody. But I think in the beginning, we copy melodies from other musicians and we learn great melodies from composers. And these things help us to improvise in a way that feels melodic to us. I think my tastes are kind of eclectic, not only jazz. If I had to pick jazz musicians that influenced me the most in terms of melody and approaches to improvisation on the guitar, they would be Jim Hall, one of my very favorites. You probably know he's playing Tugonea. 
I love Jim Hall. I like other guitarists too. I love Wes Montgomery. He's a beautiful, natural player. I don't sound anything like him, but I love him. Um, I like some of the modern guitar players of my generation, like John Schofield and Pat Metheny and Bill Frizzell. I don't really sound like them either, but I like them all. They all have a very personal voice. Uh, I also love classical music, and I don't study it, but I love. So I love Bach. I love some of the French composers: Ravel, Debussy, Poulenc, Messiaen. Are fantastic. And I've listened to a lot of classical music, so maybe some of those melodies somehow have come into my、uh, concept of how to be melodic and improvise. And I also tell musicians not only to listen to people on your instrument, to have a broader sense of how to improvise and be melodic. So, listen to singers and horn players if you're a guitarist to learn how to leave space. Listen to piano players to learn how to accompany. So my tastes are pretty broad, not only one style,、um, and I listen to many other instruments for my influences and ideas too. My guitar teacher that I mentioned earlier, Link Chamberlain, encouraged me to listen, but not copy if I could find my own way. So some little voice in my head told me, "Listen." Be aware of the traditions, but you don't have to copy. And I never really copied anyone. I did not transcribe solos. I didn't really memorize so many solos. I tried to find my own vocabulary, and this involves maybe more arpeggios and chord shapes. So the intervals in my soloing probably are a little bit wider than some musicians. And I tried to find my own way. My intuition just told me to do this. So it happened very slowly to create your own vocabulary. I'm still working on it, and I think it is still being changed. Still changes and is still being refined. I've been playing jazz guitar for fifty years, David, and it is still slowly changing each year. It's still changing. I'm thinking maybe a little more contrapuntally now, a little more like a piano on the guitar with some of the voices that move inside the chord, some of the intervals. And some people say he sounds a little like a pianist. That's what I'm trying to do. So it happened very slowly, but it just was some voice which told me. Try to find your own way. Listen, but try to find your own way. So I had to create my own vocabulary, and I'm still doing it. But I think my teacher, Link Chamberlain, was very useful in encouraging me to to try to find my own path. I think I encourage every young musician to play with the best musicians that they can. So I love being the man who has the least experience in the group, and this has happened to me many times in the beginning. When I was first studying with my two teachers, Link Chamberlain and John Meighan, I would, when I got good enough, they would let me sit in with them and play a few songs. So I was playing with musicians who were much better, much more experienced than I was. They knew many more songs. They knew much more about how the music would work. That really helped me. So I, I'd be hard to pick one, but there's certainly some encounters with Link Chamberlain, my teacher. I had a chance to play with Dave Liebman a few times, just sitting in on gigs, and Frank Vaccari, who played great tenor, also with Woody Herman, Michael Moore, amazing bass player, because they all played with my teacher, Link Chamberlain, small gigs. And I wouldn't play the whole gig, but Link would allow me to come up and play one or two songs. And the other musicians knew I was his student, but they were very kind to me, very encouraging. They let me play with them. And I try to do this also. If younger musicians want to come and play, I want to encourage them for the same reason to help them become better. And sometimes you get better simply by playing with a great musician. You discover things about harmony, rhythm, having the conversation on the bench, and simply by playing with a great musician. So I've had many, many of these encounters. Many. I think if I had to pick a few musicians, probably Jim Hall on the guitar. He was very eclectic in his approach to music. He incorporated elements of jazz, blues, classical music. He had a very personal style, 
and I love his harmonic approach. I love his composing too. I play a few of his songs. I also am influenced by piano players, so I played、uh, for part of our、uh, podcast interview, the episode. I played several songs from Bill Evans. I love his approach to harmony and his melodies. Herbie Hancock, I also like very much. How they approach improvising, how they comp, how they compose. So I think as much influenced by piano as guitar. But if I had to pick three, maybe those three would be the ones who are most important to me in terms of influencing my notion of melody and harmony. Other people that I love very much in terms of how they improvise are Cannonball Adderley, amazing saxophonist who played with Miles Davis and his own groups, Sonny Rollins, especially in the 1960s, and Jim Hall, the guitarist I mentioned. Also played with Sonny for about a year, and they had a beautiful group together. So those are some of my favorite musicians for sure. I also tell、uh, younger musicians to listen to some of the great earlier swing musicians. I love Coleman Hawkins, Ben Webster, Don Bias. These are musicians who came up in the 1930s and 40s who were amazing, and they had a beautiful approach to melody. Also, Coleman Hawkins, especially, I love. Incredible. So you know, kind of eclectic, and not only from one period of jazz. A different idea about how to study and learn rhythm.、Uh, some people think it's very important to be able to read music well to understand rhythm. It certainly is a useful skill. I am not a good reader. I can learn written music, but I'm not a sight reader. If you put something in front of me, I have to learn it. I can't sight read it. Many musicians are very good sight readers. They can look at something for the first time and read it perfectly. That's not me. I tell students if you want to learn to read music, you can certainly study and do this. It's a good skill to have, but You can learn a lot about rhythm simply to listening to musicians and learning their vocabulary. So I, I'm playing, and I'm not necessarily thinking not a quarter note to a triplet. Maybe that's what I'm playing. These are rhythms that I've learned from listening to other musicians. So if I'm going do ba do be da ba ba di ba do ba di and di do da da da, I guess I could write all that down, but I, it would be hard for me. But I can hear it and I can play it. Also, some rhythms that are built into the melodies that I'm learning then become rhythms that I can use when I improvise. So, when we learn great melodies or portions of people's solos, if we want to copy them, those rhythms then become a part of our vocabulary. And I played with many, many great drummers, piano players, guitar. Guitar players are usually not as good with accompaniment as piano in some cases. So, listening how a piano player uses rhythm not only when they solo but how they accompany people has really influenced me a lot. And playing with great drummers, you pick up those rhythms simply by playing together. I can sing lots of rhythms that I would have difficulty writing down, but I, they, I know I know how they feel. So, rhythm for me happened by osmosis, not from studying it on the page. Sometimes question if what we're doing has value because we don't like the way we sound. This has happened to me many times, and I think sometimes you're not getting a lot of encouragement from other musicians or people who are trying to、uh, that you're contacting to try to get work. You're not getting any response. That can be very discouraging. You think, "Am I on the right path?" But I think ultimately, if you think that you're on the right path, then you keep going 
and sometimes this, the doubt or the lack of recognition or the frustrations makes you stronger if you can push through. Because if I think if you're doing something that has quality and you work hard, you can find your audience. Maybe it's a small audience. My audience is not big. It's just big enough that I can survive. I can make enough money to keep going and not do another job. And that's all I need. I've kept my expenses very low, very simple. I let my living expenses at home are very low. I don't have expensive tastes. So this allows me to keep going. And if nobody liked my music, I would still play the guitar. When we had the pandemic, for a long time, I didn't play with anybody. No gigs, no other musicians for you know, maybe six months. And I thought, well, I still want to play the guitar every day. Well, I still want, and I did. I wanted to play every day still. And I tried to connect with other musicians on the computer. So I kept myself going in this way. So we all have doubts. And I think the idea is to try to find your way back to loving the music if you go away from it somehow and you're not happy. So the doubts can make you stronger if you're willing to somehow push through and keep going. Not always. There's some very good musicians who have doubts and they stop. They can't go on. And so not everybody can do this. I have been able to. But I have had doubts, absolutely. Where no gigs and frustrations because I didn't like the way I sounded. And we all have these doubts. It's normal for all of us. We can also encourage each other. If you see a friend who has doubts, you try to find the good things in their playing and encourage them to keep going. And maybe help them. Get them a gig. Play with them. We try to help each other. Huh? I said earlier, I'll mention it again now for this question, uh, definitely have been, been influenced in the last 20 years by piano players and jazz. How they accompany, the rhythmic vocabulary of how they accompany, how they voice the chords, but especially the rhythm. Guitar players maybe are a little bit lazy when we accompany people. We play the chords correctly, but we're not focusing on rhythmic figures. And if you play a particular rhythmic figure, this sets up a dialogue in the rhythm section with the other musicians, if you're playing in a group and also gives the soloist more to respond to if you're playing strong rhythms. And it could be syncopations. You know, I tell musicians, listen to big band. Listen to what the big band horns are doing behind the solo. Maybe it's po, de, ba, do, ba, ba, do, ding, ba, 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 ba. If I play that with my chords, maybe not exactly that rhythm all the time, that sets up maybe even less, maybe more space, but clear rhythms. This sets up a dialogue in the group that doesn't happen if you don't play in this way. So I've definitely been influenced by piano. Uh, definitely influenced by drummers, in terms of also rhythmic figures, how to solo using some of the same rhythms, and influenced by horn players and singers, as I said earlier, to leave space on the guitar. Very important to have space in the music to allow the conversation to unfold with the other musicians. So almost every other instrument, and, and, and also vocalists, I have, have influenced me in some way. I tell musicians initially that there are probably 15 or 20 standards 
that were not originally written for the most part by people who could play jazz. George Gershwin could improvise. He probably would, I would consider him a jazz musician, but most of the, of the composers who wrote standards were writing them for Broadway shows, musicals in New York, and for film, for movies later on. So these were not uh, written by jazz musicians, so they did not have the syncopations of a jazz song. But they're beautifully constructed tunes, and if you know 10 or 15 of them, you can sit in, in Paris, New York, Tokyo, anywhere, if you know those songs. So I encourage everybody to learn those first. So I learned the basic ones first. Stella by Starlight, All the Things You Are, Autumn Leaves, On Green Dolphin Street, Days of Winding Roses, and others. And there are probably 20 of those that if you know them, you can play anywhere in the world to sit in a jam session. So that's where you start. But now I like to find the more obscure standards. So Jerome Kern, who wrote All the Things You Are, his last song is one I like very much that I play called Nobody Else But Me. And nobody plays that song, almost nobody. It's his last song. He wrote it for a revival of Showboat. So now I'm looking for standards that are not so often played. Nobody Else But Me, Soon, from um, also from Gershwin. Is it Gershwin? Yeah. What are some other ones I like? Everything I Love from Cole Porter I like very much. And even experienced jazz musicians don't necessarily know these songs. So, you know, there are hundreds of standards. I like I Should Care. I like, um, what are some others? Star Eyes. Some of these are common tunes, some are not. So I'm not necessarily, in my, in my performances now, in my recordings, I play obscure songs that people don't know. My opinion now is it's okay to introduce the audience to something that is beautiful that they haven't heard before. If you like it, hopefully they like it too. So in the beginning, we start with the songs that everybody knows. I also tell musicians to pay attention to the melody because jazz musicians interpret the melody of a standard in a way that is different rhythmically. They add more syncopation. So pay attention to the melody and understand the fact that the melody can also be something that you can approach in a creative way, not only the solo. Listen to how Bill Evans plays a melody to Stella, or Miles Davis, or listen to how Ella Fitzgerald sings it, and you'll hear something different each time. The melody's important. So improvisation in the beginning, when you're a young jazz musician, I think involves really listening to many great solos, and you discover some musical values that work for you. It's not really a game plan exactly about who you will like, you just want to be exposed to many great players and you will say, wow, he sounds amazing. So that was my feeling when I heard Jim Hall, for instance, I loved his playing. And I do, I think I'm influenced probably the most by him from guitar players, although I don't really sound like him. But I love his use of space, how he thinks about melody, how he allows for the conversations to unfold in the group. So I think basically, um, you know, you discover the people that you love through trial and error. And then you, and then it's a kind of a symbol of vocabulary in your approach to this. So I think it's, there's no real clear path about how this will happen. You just need to be exposed to many great musicians and you'll discover a set of musical values. Does that make sense? I think it's, I didn't know in the beginning how I wanted to sound. So you just you find a path just by being exposed to as many great musicians as you can. And as I said earlier, it's really okay to copy to start to develop a vocabulary. Teaching improvisation, that's tricky. Because a great improviser is really in the moment. What you can teach is to hear a great solo with your student and say, listen to what he's doing here, let's analyze this. 
and maybe in the beginning you're copying his idea or her idea to develop your own vocabulary. But I think the idea is to know the harmony so well and to know your instrument so well that you can be really in the moment and not have an exact plan about how you will improvise. You know the harmony, you know what you're capable of on the instrument, and you're a good enough listener that you can also respond to what the other musicians are playing to create something together in the moment. And that's our goal. My goal is to have the best conversation with my friends when we're playing together in the moment. I'm using their resources. So as you become a better player, you also become a better listener and you're able to more quickly respond to information that the other musicians are giving you if you're playing in a group. If I'm playing alone, it's just my resources. But even in duo, I have someone else that I can play off of and take their information to help me create something. We're creating together. So this is what great improvisation is to me. It's not only the individual solo, but the exchange of ideas and the synergy of all the musicians working together to create something. And this, we can teach this by listening to a great band, not only the great solo, but a great band, and pointing out to the student, listen to how the drummer is influencing the rhythms of the solo. Listen to how the accompanist is supporting the solo. Listen to how the soloist is responding to the accompanist. So you can point out these things to the student to give them an idea about how great improvisation unfolds in a group. So modes are important, absolutely. Modes are just degrees of scales, and the four scales that I use, and the modes from those scales, are the major scale, so diatonic. So every, every note in that scale, every different degree of that scale, is a different sound. And all you're doing, essentially, is using each one of those notes as the tonic, or the root note, and then reconfiguring the notes in the scale to suggest a new chord and a new mode. So if you play a C major scale, Do Major, and then start on Re, and play the chords and arpeggios from that, it's a minor sound, it's the Dorian minor. Mi is Phrygian minor, that's flamenco music, and so forth. So we can do this with each note of any scale to create the modes, and then we have different chords and arpeggios to suggest the new sound. So the four scales I use are the diatonic major scale, melodic minor, those modes I've used, Link Chamberlain taught me these modes in 1971 or two, I still use them very often, harmonic minor, and harmonic major, those are the four scales. Each one of those modes is really interesting. They give you different colors and flavors over major chords, minor chords, and dominant chords. And then I mix together the complex sounds with the simple sounds of the basic arpeggio. So you have access to simple sounds and then layers of more complex harmony on top. But the modes are important because they help you organize harmonic information. They help you to see how a minor chord can sound basic or less basic or very different from the original sound. And each one of these modes has a very distinct character and flavor. So the modes are important for me, and I like to know the names of them and how they work. And you can also recognize the sounds that other musicians are referencing if you study this harmony. You recognize, oh, he's using this mode. I can hear it. So some of this is indicated in the song. Other times we can play it in a very free way. If I just see <coughs> Do Major, C Major, there's a very simple way to play C Major, but there are all kinds of harmonic, melodic, minor, harmonic major sounds that are very different from the original major, and I'll just think of these as layers of harmony. And then I decide how much tension I want to use based on who I'm playing with. But the modes are important to help you organize harmony and recognize harmony from other musicians and build up your ear. Very important.
jam sessions. I still go. Now, jam sessions, you're usually not learning new songs, but if you're going to someone's house, which I still do, then you can encourage people to bring new music. I have a regular session I've gone to for the last two years in Portland, Oregon, where I live, with usually four or five other friends. Sometimes it's two guitars, violin, bass, and drums, not the usual group, and everybody's bringing new songs. So I have a big stack of new music, and I play with them. And I like some of these tunes a lot. I like them, some of them so much that they're now in my repertoire. I'll play them with other musicians on my gigs. So I really like using jam sessions at people's houses to learn new music. Now, if you're at a club, it's familiar songs. So then it's not uh, trying to find something new to play. It's just having fun playing songs that everybody knows. But this is still good training to get up on stage for one or two songs and understanding the fact that always it's, it's not always perfect at a jam session. Sometimes you're playing with very inexperienced players. Then your job is to help them. And I think the audience likes to see a mixture of experienced players and players who are not so experienced helping each other. And so when the younger players become better, they will remember this lesson and they will then try to help the younger players who are coming up under them. So a jam session at a club is just to have fun and play familiar tunes. A jam session at someone's house for me is something different. Bring new songs try to read and learn new things, because I'm still trying to learn songs, old songs and new songs both. So jam sessions, a private jam session is different from one at a club. I like to do both. I went to a jam session in, um, where was I? In Madrid about a week ago at a little Egyptian restaurant playing flamenco music with my friends, and I had a good time just playing songs, but it was fun. Someone came in actually who lives, who was from, from Argentina. He lives in Madrid. I had met him 25 years ago. And he walked into the club and he didn't know I'd be there. We looked at each other and he said, I was at your clinic in 1996. So sometimes you'll meet old friends at jam sessions. But they're important to learn new songs, to develop chemistry, to help the younger musicians. For all those reasons, it's important. Very important. So everyone should try to compose for this reason because composition and improvisation, as I said, reinforce and help each other. So how do you begin to compose? Maybe you take a small section of one of your solos and think this is a strong melody here that I'm improvising. Can I somehow expand this into a song? So very often I'll take a particular rhythm and I will play it more than once with different harmonies. So those songs of mine demonstrate that. The song Tapioca Time, the first original of mine, has a rhythm that goes ba do da do da do do da bo do da da. Four bars later, I do it again. Bo ba da 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 bo do da da. That's a rhythm I found. I used it twice. The harmony is completely different the second time. So part of, I think, composition and part of great soloing are rhythmic ideas that are connected. It may be the identical rhythm with different harmonies. So they're little tricks or little ideas that you can use to build a strong composition. And we do the same thing with a strong solo. So they have things in common. Um, if you compose enough material, then you begin to have a style as a composer. And then your composition begins to, your compositional skills, your songs begin to um, affect and influence the way you improvise. So when you're improvising, you're thinking like a composer. Can I connect an idea together with another one? Not just individual ideas. I'm trying to create something that has structure. So to me, great solos sound like composition. And you can begin to think like a composer if you take portions of your improvisations and try to expand them out into songs. Now, if you're really stuck and don't know how to compose, you can do what Charlie Parker did very often, which is create contrafacts. And that means you're taking a song that you like already, you know the chord changes, you take away the original melody and try to create a new melody on an existing set of changes. So then you're not having to compose the harmony and the melody, you're simply taking harmony that you know already and trying to create a melody. That makes it a little easier to compose. Charlie Parker did this with almost all his songs. He took old standards, took away the melody, and wrote a, maybe a very complicated melody. So back home in Indiana, which is da 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 da, became Donnelly. Completely, it sounds like him solving. It's a solo, basically. So we don't have to make a melody as complicated as Charlie Parker's, but the point being, you can take a song that you like and that you know, take away the melody. If you are stuck and can't compose, you feel like you're stuck. Take away the melody of a song that you like, you have the chords already, and try to create a new melody. And your, your melody should sound like maybe a simplified version of how you solo. And sometimes it works. 
Sometimes. So definitely I encourage everyone to compose for this reason because you're composing reinforces and strengthens and improves your improvising. They work together, as your question implied. I don't think any of my improvisations are fantastic. Some feel pretty inspired and pretty good. How does that happen? It's mysterious. Everything has to be working for that to happen. I try to play well every time I play, including tonight with you. But if my hands are cold, if the room has a sound that I don't like, if I'm distracted, then it's gonna be like an okay night, but not an amazing night. But everything is really working well. You're rested, great to see your friends, people that you played with before, maybe this can help to have a good musical connection with the other musicians, playing material that you know well. Then for me, it feels like there's a flow. And I'm not thinking, I'm not working. I'm playing the guitar, I'm not even looking most of the time, I'm just hearing things. I'm hearing beautiful information coming from the other musicians to help me to build myself up. I'd say that happens once in a while, but it's not often. But I never think of myself as a fantastic musician, but sometimes I hear it and I think, pretty good pretty good and that's the most I will ever think this is why we drive ourselves to get better I want to continue to improve I feel like I'm still improving so I would never say I mean if someone else likes what you're doing you're grateful if someone says I love that that happens once in a while and you say thank you very much I never almost never say I love my playing I like it sometimes sometimes I don't like it at all but this is what drives us to continue to improve and work and that we can get we can get better we can continue to improve this is really important so I would never call anything I've done fantastic. I'm proud of some of my work, but I wouldn't call any of it fantastic. If someone else likes it, great. That's fine. But I think to stay humble and keep working is what drives us to keep getting better. So that's the attitude I want to have. I'm, I don't have a big ego about my playing, and uh, I don't think I'm a fantastic musician. I'm a pretty good musician now. I've been working at this for so long, but can I get much better? Absolutely. And sometimes I don't like my playing at all. So this is normal for all of us. So I, haven't, I wouldn't say I know a lot about art, but I have to look at a beautiful painting. Can that help you as a musician? Jim Hall said this. Jim Hall said, sometimes put the guitar away and go to a museum and look at beautiful paintings. I mean, every experience in life somehow influences the way you play because your playing is an expression of your experiences in life. So I've been traveling for you know more than 40 years. I've been in about 20 countries. And if you go with the right attitude to another place, respect for the culture, curiosity for the culture, uh, be, wanting to appreciate what every culture offers. Every country has an interesting culture. And if you're polite and curious and respectful, generally people are very helpful and kind also to you. And I have beautiful relationships with musicians all over the world who are kind to me, helping me to play with them, sharing their information with me so I can go to their countries or their cities and work with them. And that has absolutely influenced the way I think about playing because I've had all these different encounters with musicians. So it's made me 
pretty flexible, pretty adaptable, because I play with so many different musicians, some of whom I'm meeting for the first time. So the idea is to quickly establish a rapport and a conversation. And the audience sees this. They know that maybe we're playing for the first time together, and they can see us working to establish a, a common ground that we can play together. I like this challenge. So all that has made me, I think, maybe a better person and a better musician. I also try to help my friends to create these connections so that we can work together. So all these life experiences, I think, have shaped my playing, too. Playing with all these different musicians, in some cases playing different styles. So playing in Argentina, I discovered a rhythm called Chacarera, which is this really interesting, maybe you heard it if you were there, too. It's kind of a weird trip of boom, 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 boom. And the jazz drummers can play in Chacarera, and I can sort of play along with that, too. So I said, let's do a standard and chacarera, and the drummers in, in Buenos Aires will nod and play that with you. So then I've discovered with my new friend Luis Gallo some flamenco chords and some of his rhythms, although I don't have the right hand technique of a flamenco guitarist, I learned some things playing with him this last week in Madrid that I think I would use. So all those things I think, I wouldn't say art has influenced me so much because I don't usually go to museums, but my travel and my experience with all these different musicians has definitely helped me grow personally and musically both. And I want to continue to do this for a while longer. As long as I've been doing it, I'd like to continue for a while. I hope I can. guitar music influenced me in a philosophical way, I'd say part of my philosophy is life is patience. To allow things to develop at a pace when it's realistic. So definitely learning guitar and thinking about music in general has taught me a lot about patience, communication, valuing what other people express in their own opinion. So all of that I think has sort of come from the study of music. So part of my philosophy of life is a bit of respect, patience, care, space, giving someone else space to express themselves. All that came from the study of music. And not specifically guitar music, just music in general. But I think space is also very important in guitar music. I don't want to hear notes all the time. I want to hear space and breath. And that I think also translates into my philosophy of life, maybe giving people space to express themselves. To me, it's very important. So in that sense, all those things have come from my study of music. music is their hobby. It's not their profession. Maybe you feel this way also, but I think music is a fantastic thing to have in your life. It gives you communication skills, memory skills, and just makes you feel great to play. So I encourage everybody, even if they don't have professional aspirations to be a professional musician, if you have any inclination to study music and to play music, to have it in your life is a great thing. And most people who study with us are not professional musicians. They are people who love music. And those are also people in some cases who support us and maybe become our patrons. Maybe they hire us for a recording or they hire us to play for them or with them. So music, I think, is also a beautiful way to have cultural exchange. To travel to other countries and hear the music of other cultures is a way into that culture that I love. And it's one of the reasons I love to share jazz with people in other countries. Although there's jazz now almost all over the world. 
and many good jazz musicians all over the world in every country, really, almost every country. So music is useful for all those reasons, and I encourage everybody who has any desire to have music in their life to study and play and, and enjoy the music. The music calls you in a very strong way if you're going to be a professional player. There's no denying it. Even if you know it's a difficult life, the music calls you in such a strong way that you know you're supposed to try to be a musician, even if it's not a perfect life. I knew this when I was young, when I was not all that talented and making no money from music, it called to me. It said, you have to try to play. And every musician I know will tell you this. We have to play. We have no choice. And that's no guarantee of success, but the music calls you in this very strong way that's undeniable. You have to try. And But everyone should have music in their lives as a wonderful hobby. So that's what I encourage everybody to do, to try to have music in your life and share with your friends. Mm -hmm.